Philip K. Dick is one of the greatest science fiction authors of all time. He wrote more than 40 novels and 100 short stories over a 30-year period. Many of his stories have been adapted into movies or television, helping to shape the modern sci-fi genre. Today we're going to take a look at perhaps his most famous novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was loosely adapted into the cult classic movie Blade Runner. On the face of it, it's a simple near-future noir story about a detective who has to hunt down rogue androids. In practice, it's so much more. What does it really mean to be alive? Does our dependence on technology make us less human? PKD explores these themes without the book ever feeling preachy, and he does so in an incredibly concise 260 pages. In this video, I'm going to break down how PKD achieves this, so you can use the same techniques in your writing. I'm going to focus in particular on how PKD links theme with character and plot, and also the pacing of the novel, two things he's a real master of. This is a deep analysis of the whole plot, so there'll be spoilers throughout. The story opens with bounty hunter Rick Deckard waking up next to his wife, Iran. They immediately start arguing because Deckard wants Iran to use a device called a mood organ to alter her state of mind. The argument quickly escalates. She accuses him of being a murderer hired by the cops. I've never killed a human being in my life, he says, to which she replies, just those poor Andes. This exchange rapidly establishes Deckard's job as a bounty hunter, his strained relationship with Iran, and the key themes of the book. On audiobook, we're only two and a half minutes in, and PKD has already hooked us with a huge amount of setup work, and all through interesting character interactions with no tedious exposition dumps. Deckard heads to the roof, and we find out he has a pet sheep, which is secretly an electronic reproduction. We discover his deep shame and sadness at this. He's been hiding the death of his real sheep, and he desperately wants to own a real, living animal again. He wants to feel close to a living thing. This is in stark contrast to the interaction we've just seen with his real, living wife, and is important foreshadowing for later. What's really remarkable about this opening chapter, and yes we're still in chapter 1, is how inextricably PKD binds together the book's themes, characters and plot. The protagonist's want for a real animal is intertwined with the theme of what is real and what is alive. In turn, this is tied to Deckard's job and plot goal of retiring Andes. It doesn't stop there though because that plot goal is generating the conflict with his wife, but also necessary for him to get the money he needs for the animal. What this means is that as the story progresses, PKD can use a single story beat to give us satisfying character, plot and theme moments all rolled into one. In Chapter 2, we meet John Istor, the second POV character in the book. John is a special, a human physically and mentally impaired by the toxic dust of Earth. John is used as a great counterbalance to Deckard. As a special, he's regarded as less than human. He has lower intelligence than an android, but he has very high levels of empathy, which cuts the core of trying to find that elusive thing called life. Again, all this is shown through the character's actions and internal monologue. No exposition dumps. John uses something called an empathy box to undergo fusion, where a large number of humans all over the earth can have a sort of shared hallucination of being Wilbur Mercer. Wilbur Mercer is the messianic figure of Mercerism, the prevailing religion of the setting. In the vision, they climb a hill and have rocks thrown at them, and when John comes out of the vision, he has a real cut 
caused by the imaginary rock. This is important later. We then have a pretty classic inciting event. Many writers still get confused about what an inciting event is and what it's meant to do. As we'll see, it isn't about the main conflict of the book starting in a historic sense. That might have happened much earlier, perhaps even before the start of the novel. It's also not when the protagonist becomes fully embroiled in the main conflict. That happens later, the first plot point. The inciting event is rather the protagonist's first brush with the main conflict. Here it comes in the form of a video call with Police HQ, where Deckard learns that eight new Nexus 6 androids have come to Earth, and one of them has shot the lead bounty hunter Deckard works for. The actual arrival of the androids on Earth happened months ago, and the shooting also happened before the start of the novel. But the inciting event is right now, when Deckard finds out about it. The pacing is perfect, coming exactly 12.5% or one-eighth of the way through the book. This pacing is really important because it's given us time to get to know the setting and characters before the main plot is introduced, and the first plot point won't happen for another eighth of the book, giving the time and space to build up to it, so it can feel like the momentous event it should be. Before going after the androids, Deckard is sent to the Rosen Corporation, who created the escaped Nexus 6 models. He meets Rachel Rosen, the beautiful heiress to the company. Deckard asks her to provide a few androids so he can administer the Voight-Kampf test, the key means for detecting an android before killing them, to make sure it works on the Nexus 6 model. Before she'll provide the androids, Rachel asks Deckard to run the VK test on her. He does, and she fails. Her father explains that this is probably because she grew up away from Earth in isolation from other humans. If this is true, it undermines the test. If it can give a false positive, it could result in bounty hunters like Deckard killing real humans by accident. This, Deckard realises, is a ruse and the corporation want to undermine the test for commercial reasons. He asks Rachel if he can ask her one more question, and then concludes she's actually an android, one of the Nexus 6 models, something she herself might not have known due to a false memory. Deckard will now be able to carry out the mission and is determined to do so. He's past the point of no return. This is the first plot point. Again, it's perfectly paced, coming at 25% or one quarter of the way through the book. We then switch to John's point of view. He's heard noises in his apartment building, and investigating, finds a girl, Pris Stratton, squatting in one of the apartments. We get the sense that she's one of the escaped androids, as she doesn't know much about life on Earth. This is an important use of John's POV. We get to see what the antagonist androids are really like through his eyes. We return to Deckard's POV. His mission has now started in earnest and he's following a clue to find the first android, Polokov. The police chief has told him an agent from the Soviet Union is going to join him as an observer. But Deckard wants to move as quickly as possible on the androids, so goes after Polokov alone. When Deckard gets to the address he's been given, Polokov isn't there. Deckard waits for the Soviet agent to join him before heading after the next target. When the Soviet arrives though, he tries to assassinate Deckard, and Deckard takes him out, realising this is Polokov using an alias to get the jump on him. This is a classic first pinch point, with the antagonist demonstrating their power. In this case, the power of the Nexus 6 androids to convincingly pose as humans. In terms of pacing, PKD is spot on once more, with the climax of this scene coming at exactly the 37% mark. The next big plot beat is the midpoint. 
It's what James Scott Bell calls a mirror moment in his book, Write Your Novel from the Middle, and it's so important he suggests shaping your whole plot around it. It's the moment in a story when the protagonist takes a long hard look in a literal or metaphorical mirror and becomes aware of the thematic truth driving their character arc, though they're not yet ready to fully embrace it. Having taken care of Polakov, Deckard heads straight off after the next android, Luba Luft, who has been hiding in plain sight, posing as a high-profile opera singer. When he tries to apply the VK test, Luba first evades answering the questions properly, then calls the police, accusing Deckard of asking her perverse questions and harassing her. Deckard is taken to a police station he's never heard of, and the arresting officer tells him that the precinct Deckard is attached to has been closed for years. Deckard meets a police chief he's never heard of and realises he's on the list of androids Deckard's supposed to retire. The chief and his head bounty hunter, Phil Resch, tell Deckard they think he's the android, with false memories implanted to make him think he's a bounty hunter. Deckard tries to call his own precinct and his wife, Iran, but both calls go unanswered or are answered by people he doesn't recognise. Deckard begins to fear he really is an android. Before Resch can test whether Deckard is human, the police chief pulls a laser tube on him and Resch kills him. Deckard and Resch are both still in doubt as to whether they might be androids too. Resch, in particular, is spiralling. They agree to test each other once they've gone back for Luba Luft. When they confront Luba, Resch kills her mercilessly. This convinces Deckard that Resch is an android. An android doesn't care about the life of another android, he thinks to himself. When they do test each other, however, they find out they are both human. It's now Deckard who descends into a spiral of self-doubt, deciding that when this is all over, he'll quit his job, move to the Mars colony and take another job, any other job. This is a fantastic midpoint, with Resch acting as the proverbial mirror through which Deckard has looked darkly. He's seen how callous and inhumane he himself is becoming, or has perhaps already become. He's not yet ready to embrace this truth though. He tells himself that the androids are still a menace to society, and he still needs money, so he can't quit now. The second pinch point is where we usually see another display of power by the antagonist. This is given to us in the next story beat from John's perspective. He's been helping Pris Stratton, the android he met earlier, move into her apartment. Now the final two androids arrive, Roy and Imgard Batty, notably the only vaguely functional couple we meet in the whole book. They want Pris to move in with John so he can help them, and they will live elsewhere in the building. We see through John's eyes the androids prepare a plan to ambush Deckard, debilitating him by making him panic by using something akin to the mood organ, and then kill him. Once more, the pacing of this beat is spot on, landing at 62% of the way in. The novel up until this point, has been a perfect example of pacing and structure. But as we head towards the second plot point, we deviate from this for the first time. Classically, the second plot point should be a huge moment where the protagonist wins a Pyrrhic victory which soon turns into disaster, usually marked by some form of literal or metaphorical death. The protagonist will have a dark night of the soul, followed by a metaphorical rebirth. But Deckard already had that dark night of the soul moment at the midpoint, and what we get from the second pinch point through to the start of the climax is more of a series of events setting up the climax itself. It's a little convoluted, so I've simplified it here. Deckard takes the money he's earned from retiring the three androids that morning and heads to a store where he can buy a living animal a goat. He takes it home and when he presents it to Iran as a surprise for her, she's delighted 
until Deckard let slip he's really bought it to help himself out of a deep depression caused by the encounter with Resha. Iran uses her own empathy box, much like the one we've seen John use, to fuse with Mercer and clear her own depression. Deckard grabs the empathy box, just before the moment where rocks are thrown in the vision, and he has a strange vision of Mercer, telling him that although his work killing androids is immoral, he should still do it. Deckard realises that he'll struggle to retire the remaining androids alone, and he calls Rachel Rosen for help. He needs her insight. As a Nexus 6, she should know how the others will think. Rachel refuses at first, saying it's too late, and only agrees to come meet Deckard for a romantic encounter. Deckard wonders if androids dream, as in have hopes and dreams, as he waits in a hotel room for her to arrive. Rachel does come, but she wants him to give up his mission and save himself from the certain death of facing the three remaining androids alone. She professes her love for him and tells him he should stay with her. He says he won't sleep with her, but changes his mind when she makes him an offer. She'll help him if he does. After they've been to bed, Rachel makes a further series of revelations. Deckard is not the first bounty hunter she's bedded, and all the others gave up retiring androids afterwards. She's been working with the escaped androids, protecting them in this way since they were on Mars. She tells Deckard he'll now be unable to retire Pris in particular because she's the same model of Nexus 6 as Rachel and looks identical to her. She's using Deckard's human empathy against him. If this is a noir story, then Rachel Rosen is the ultimate femme fatale. She's using sex as a weapon with cold, calculated android cunning but Deckard insists he'll still continue his mission, even if it means death. We then switch POVs to John again. He finds a real living spider, but when he takes it to show Pris, she begins dismembering it to see if it can still walk with four legs. She expresses resentment that humans feel more empathy for the lowliest of living things, including spiders, than for androids. While this happens, the other androids watch a TV expose proving Mercer is a fraud. This is a horrifically painful moment for John. Just when John thinks things can't get any worse for him, an alarm goes off. A bounty hunter has entered the building. This is the start of the climax, and this whole scene with John is another powerful example of PKD bringing together character, plot and theme around a single beat with precision timing. We're exactly 88% of the way through the book. John is sent downstairs and meets with Deckard. Despite the android's cruelty, John stills empathy and loyalty towards them and won't tell Deckard which apartment they are in or even which floor they are on. There is a classic mental moment which often happens in this section of a book or film just before the climax. Deckard has another vision of Mercer, who warns him that one of the androids is behind him. He turns and at first lowers his laser tube, thinking it's Rachel Rosen, but then realises it's Pris Stratton and shoots her, despite Rachel's prediction he won't be able to. Deckard realises that if he keeps on being a bounty hunter, this might not be the last android with Rachel's face he has to retire. He then heads upstairs the batties and the climactic moment. Tricking his way into the apartment by impersonating John, Deckard kills the last androids. For them, he says, winter has come. In a line so reminiscent of a Game of Thrones, I wonder whether it might actually have inspired George R. R. Martin. Deckard heads home to find Iran upset. She tells him the goat is dead. Someone came and threw it off of the building. She describes the perpetrator and Deckard realises it was Rachel Rosen taking revenge. Deckard then drives into the wastelands which surround the city, feeling fatigued and crushed. He climbs a mountain and has an experience like fusion with Mercer, even being hit by a stone and cut. He begins to believe he has become Mercer himself and in the dust finds a toad. 
This is the first time Descartes has ever just stumbled upon a living thing. Excited, he takes it home to Iran. We slip briefly into her point of view for the first time and see Descartes' homecoming from her perspective. She's overjoyed to see the toad, but quickly discovers it's really mechanical. Descartes decides it doesn't matter. Mechanical things have their lives too, no matter how paltry, he thinks, demonstrating that he has found his empathy at last. In a brief resolution passage, Descartes heads for bed, and we go back to Rand's point of view. In a brilliant inversion of the opening scene, she considers using the mood organ to help him sleep, as he often sleeps poorly and wakes up having nightmares. Tonight, though, she decides she doesn't need to, as he's at peace. The book closes with Iran making herself a cup of coffee, the suggestion being that through all they've been through, Descartes and Iran have found a greater appreciation for each other and can move forwards with their life together. This was my second or third time reading this novel, and though I knew the ending, it still genuinely left me with tears in my eyes. I think this was thanks to the powerful mirroring between the hook at the start of the book and the ending, bringing the plot, character arcs and themes to a stunning, simultaneous conclusion. As I reread the book for this review, I found I had a good recollection of all the major plot points, despite the eight or ten years which had passed since the last time. The exception was the sequence centred around Rachel and Deckard in the hotel. The scene where Rachel reveals her previous liaisons with other bounty hunters should have been memorable, and could have acted as a third act gateway, but I barely remembered it at all. I wonder if the pacing issues I highlighted earlier might have been the reason for this, but what do you think? Is that just post hoc rationalisation? Let me know in the comments section below. Despite those wrinkles, this is still one of the greatest sci-fi novels ever written. If you're an aspiring author, the big takeaways for you should be, firstly, the power of the intertwining of your story's plot, themes and character arcs together as tightly as possible. And secondly, the role of pacing in making your key story beats as impactful and memorable as possible. Have a think about your latest writing project and how you could use these tools to improve it. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. This is a brand new channel, but if enough people like the video, I'll turn Write Like a Legend into a monthly series. If you've got any suggestions for books to cover next or any thoughts on the video, please leave a comment below and we can have a discussion. I'll do my best to react or reply to every single comment.